It's the final week of competition. I believe you can cook. Absolutely dreadful. Oh, come on. 2008 was a rough year for Cartoon Network. Everything was basically on its way out. Ed and Eddie, Kids Next Door, Ben 10, Jim Partner, Camp Laszlo, out of Jimmy's head? How is the network gonna survive without out of Jimmy's head? What's your plan? <laughs> My plan? Why'd you think I wanted you to break out with me? If I had a plan, what would I need you for? <laughs> Not to mention that one of the worst cartoon droughts ever was about to hit with the rise of CN Real. It was tough being a CN kid back then. I mean, it's kinda tough now being one. How are there only three Cartoon Network originals airing right now? And two of them are wrapping up. Who is in charge up there? Oh yeah, my condolences. But 2008 was a transition period, which at least meant that cartoons were still being made. And more importantly, action cartoons were still being made. You see, Ben 10 made Cartoon Network quite a bit of money, so for a while, they wanted to make even more shows like it to fill out the schedule. This led to the sequel, Ben 10 Alien Force, Batman Brave and the Bold, Star Wars The Clone Wars, and what we're here to talk about today, The Secret Saturdays. This fall, a brand new Cartoon Network original series launches into action. We've never pushed your power this far. I'm ready for this. The Secret Saturdays. A family of scientists dedicated to tracking the world's most bizarre creatures fight to stop the evil VDR Ghost and his plan to rule the world. Doc, Gru, and Zack are... Come on, people. Action time. The Secret Saturdays. Coming this fall. Only on Cartoon Network. The Secret Saturdays was a cartoon series created by Jay Stevens, and it focused on a family of globetrotting scientists whose main job was the study of cryptids, which are basically the thing in between animals and mythology. Think stuff like the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot. Which, quick aside, how is Bigfoot that crazy a concept to people? Like, gorillas exist. I don't think that Bigfoot is that much of a stretch. Stay woke. When the show first premiered, I wasn't that into it to be honest, and it was always on at such random times that it never really got a chance to grow on me. I remember I only really started watching around the second and final season. Most of my friends dismissed it as a Ben 10 wannabe, and I kind of did too and eventually it just kind of faded away. But now that I've had a proper chance to watch it from start to finish, I have got to say, this show is insanely underrated. I had a blast watching every episode, and before I knew it, I had watched the whole thing. And now that I've finally watched the whole show, I can't believe it didn't take off as hard as Ben 10 did. So, what makes The Secret Saturdays so good? That's what we're here to discuss. I'm your host and local urban legend, D'Angelo Edwards, and today, I'm taking my hat off to The Secret Saturdays. Cartoon Network. One, a two. Here I go, I'm about to freak the flow. About the Cartoon Network. And things they show. We got the super adventures, tune heads, and late night. It's black and white, but everything's alright. But I'll break it down a little bit more. Tell you what they have in store with his tunes you're looking for. We got Fred Plistone and Bonnie Rubble. My man. Guess what, Melanie? Mrs. Stevens gave us an oral report to do, and I'm doing mine on superheroes. You can tell me all kinds of Jet Cat secrets, right? Sure, but I'll have to kill you afterwards. Really? Before we get started, let's take some time to get to know the creator of the show, Jay Stevens. Jay actually didn't get his start in animation. He was much more focused on comics and made a good name for himself in the alternative comic scene, a movement that spun out of underground comics after a lot of artists felt that the themes of sex and drugs had basically taken over the market. This new group let people experiment outside of stuff like superheroes while still fervoring their craft and finding out new ways of storytelling. Popular series like ElfQuest and even Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles came out at this time, and overall, alternative comics played a very important role in growing the scene. 
Jay's contribution to alternative comics started with titles like Reactor Girl and Sin, doing smaller stories in the books before starting his own weekly comic strip, Oddville. The strip featured a bunch of different characters, but one in particular caught the eye of Fred Schaefer, a producer best known for his work on stuff like JJ the Jet Plane and the Goofy movie. He even helped out on most of the good Disney directed DVD sequels, except Return of Jafar. That one can burn. Granny's gonna grab ya! Anyway, the character that caught his eye was was Jet Cat. Working with Schaefer, Jay developed four shorts that would later be picked up by Nickelodeon for their animation showcase, Kablam. I definitely remember watching these as a kid. They didn't come on as often as stuff like Action League Now or Life with Loopy, but I remember loving Jet Cat. It followed the life of Melanie McKay, a girl with the ability to transform into Jet Cat, a superhero with the power to fly like a jet and fight like a cat. Oh, that's why they call it that. The shorts were a fun, cute time with an appealing art style and really catchy music, composed by Pat Irwin, who also did music for stuff like Rocco, Pepper Ann, and Class of 3000. You can definitely hear that surfer twang in all those shows. But sadly, after Kablam ended in 2000, that basically meant the end for Jet Cat, at least in animated form. While Jet Cat would continue to live on in comic books, Jay's next animated project would be a lot more under Raps. Tuddenstein premiered on Discovery Kids in 2003 and was Jay's second cartoon show. It followed Cleo Carter, a young girl dealing with the changes of growing up. New feelings, changing emotions, oh yeah, and also a mummy. Your hair, it looks like a donkey's butt. <laughs> What the fuck? Classic puberty stuff. We've all been there. I used to love Tuddenstein. I've always had an interest in mythology, and this show helped introduce me to a lot of Egyptian gods and goddesses, while also making likable characters out of Tud and Cleo. And they even made sure a lot of it was accurate, even bringing in an Egyptologist to help fact check. Wait, that's a real word? You can just add ologist to anything? English is a joke. Anyway, the show ran from 2003 to 2007, actually ending with a TV movie in 2008 that explained the mystery of how Tut actually died, which I always thought was pretty crazy. Like, Tut died when he was 10. He's a mummy, like an actual dead person. A lot of cartoons for kids treat mummies like any other monster, but like, they exist. There's people jerky underneath those bandages. Hey, professor. Mm, great jerky. Mm. My god, this is an outrage. I was going to eat that mummy. And it's cool that this show acknowledged it. The show was pretty popular too, even winning two daytime Emmys. And with Jay being such a fan of history and myths, it makes sense that he would start to develop even more ideas in that vein. So he got to work on a pitch called Cryptids. It focused on a team of cryptids turned detectives, who along with their 9 year old human mascot Francis, went all over the world protecting other cryptids and hiding their existence from humanity. It's an interesting concept that kind of reminds me of Danny Phantom. You had a ghost hunting ghost, so why not have a cryptid hunt a cryptid? But after shopping this pitch around, none of the networks were really biting. However, after the success of Ben 10, Cartoon Network decided to try and rework the pitch into more of an action-focused show. And Jay would later say that most of their changes actually helped the show in the long run, though he did freak out a little at first over some name changes in the color of the uniforms. But after some retooling, Cryptids eventually became The Secret Saturdays. Camera phone! I don't know if any of you guys remember this, but they kind of went all out in the marketing for this show. Nowadays, shows are lucky if they get a commercial, but back in the golden age of television, shows would get entire campaigns based around them. 
I'm coming to you from here in the woods with Moron Laszlo. The star of Cartoon Network's hit series Camp Laszlo was seen cavorting with a bear. Custom bumpers, music videos, puppets, you name it. Back then, if you didn't have at least one commercial stuck in your head, then someone wasn't doing their job right. And Secret Saturdays was no exception. Cartoon Network created a series of ads that used the found footage style to promote the different creatures you would see in the show. And I still remember seeing them. They were like legit well done and even kind of creepy. And if you look at them now, they've aged pretty well. Definitely helps that the grainy video helps hide what I'm sure is very dated CGI. But as it is now, still very effective. Even looking through some of the YouTube comments, it seems like a lot of kids were freaked out by these. And there is no better way to make something stick in a kid's brain than by scarring them for life. That one's going in the vault. There are people out there that haven't watched the cartoon in like 20 years who still remember Return to Slab. You say traumatize, I say monetize. This all led back to a website called cryptidsareal.com, a website that had info about the show on it, though with some info blacked out to add to the mystery, good touch. But it was all made in Flash, so you can't really access most of it now, and what you can access is only available through the Wayback Machine. Still, cool that it was a thing. Besides this, they also passed out flyers for a show called Weird World at San Diego Comic Con. They had a link for a website on the back of them telling you not to believe the Secret Saturdays. This website however is even worse off, and the only thing that came up for it is some text. It's cool that so much stuff has been archived, but I guess you can't save everything. But after this summer campaign, The Secret Saturdays made its premiere on October 3rd, 2008. Hey guys, in case you haven't heard, I'm working on my very own cartoon, Screen Time, a show about young artists trying to make a name for themselves in the social media ruled world, all while juggling jobs, relationships, and everything in between. I'm hoping to bring back that old MTV Adult Swim style of adult shows. Think stuff like Clerks Animated, Mission Hill, and Downtown. I'm currently working on a short, so if you want to help me make it, you can leave a donation or purchase a commission. Link in the description. Help me make something special. Everybody has secrets. My family just has bigger ones. They're called cryptids. Alright, let's get into the meat and potatoes. What is The Secret Saturdays all about? The show follows a cryptozoologist family who are members of The Secret Scientist, an organization that deals with science deemed too dangerous for the public. The team includes Doc Saturday. He's the father of the family and wielder of the Battle Glove, a gauntlet that controls four different powers, and strict believer of science and only science. Oh, dangerous ground, Paul. Those domes are focal points for mystic energy. Inuit shamans use them as supernatural burial mounds. Hypothetically, Drew Saturday, the mother of the family and wielder of a mystic Tibetan fire sword, and Zack Saturday, their child gifted with the ability to control and influence cryptids, often boosting his powers with his claw, an artifact that Doc retrofitted for Zack to fight with, turning into a grappling hook bow staff combo. They're aided by three other cryptids. Komodo, a genetically altered Komodo dragon with the ability to turn invisible, Zahn, a pterosaur that Zack found in the Amazon, and Fiskerton, a gorilla cat that was once known as the Fiskerton Phantom, before being brought in by the Saturdays. While you would think these guys would be treated as pets, they're more so looked at as family, with Zack even referring to them as his brothers and sister. The Saturdays travel all over the world, protecting people from cryptid attacks and protecting cryptids from people. However, they do pick up their family fair share of villains along the way, with the main one being VV Argos, a psychotic cryptic collector who goes out of his way to torment the Saturdays, along with hosting Weird World, which regardless of his supervillain status, Zack still regularly enjoys. Why do we have 19 recorded episodes of VV Argos Weird World? Uh, research? Both the Saturdays and Argos are after Kerr, 
an ancient cryptid that has the power to control every cryptid in the world. With Argos wanting it to raise an army, and the Saturdays wanting to seal its power away for good, we follow their battle to keep the world safe from villains like Argos, along with uncovering the mystery of Kerr and how he connects to Zack's powers. It's such a good concept for a show, both creatively and marketability wise. What's cooler than traveling all over the world chasing down monsters like Mothman and Chupacabras, all while fighting off cyborgs and some crazy half spider dude? I'm not sure what I'm more jealous of. The fact that Zack got to live his childhood globe trotting and cryptid hunting, or him actually having a stable two parent household. While a lot of the show is mostly kept to Monster of the Week style storytelling, there's enough of a plot going on in the background that it keeps you coming back for more. If not to just check out the new cryptid, then to find the next piece of the puzzle. The show looks great too. I was actually shocked by how good it looks. For one thing, it is constantly moving. The character acting is on point, really selling the emotions of the characters. And the storyboarding is phenomenal. Some of the fight scenes get really creative with camera angles and just the choreography itself. Some top tier talent was involved in the storyboarding team. Like Scott Geralds, who has worked on stuff like Freakazoid and Static shock. The character designs are great too. Jay led the art direction himself, and I think his background in comics really shines here. The thick black lines and shape-based characters look great, drawing inspiration from the older Hanna-Barbera cartoons like Space Ghost and Johnny Quest, taking a lot of influence from the works of Alex Toth, legendary artist, go check out his stuff if you can. You also have Dave Kupchik on character design, and I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. He worked on stuff like Hercules, Treasure Planet, and Mulan, not to mention his crowning achievement, Norm of the North Keys to the Kingdom. Hurry up and get on your knees, peasant. You're in the presence of greatness. He also helped to animate Shell from Road to El Dorado, which uh, might explain Drew. Respectfully, of course. Though Jay and him both had a hand in designing characters, so equal horny blame. I think the only thing I wasn't immediately sold on were the black noses. It kinda made them look like they were monks on a mission, but it grew on me over time. And propping up the stellar art is the amazing voice cast they got for it. It's been a while since I've liked the voice acting cast as much as this one. Sam Lerner gives Zack just the right amount of preteen cockiness that you like him without him annoying you. Now, I warn you, I've haggled with street vendors from Cairo to Kuala Lumpur, so... For you, free. Really? Of course not. This is a business. In general, I found Zack to be really likable. It can be hard to make a kid crime fighter feel believable while also making him competent. And they nail it with Zack, who messes up just enough to remind you that he's still a kid, while still holding his own as part of the team. Something I found really impressive was the natural progression of his skills as the show went on. He starts off barely knowing how to control his powers, and being mostly a nuisance on missions, to coming into his own as a fully fledged member of the team. Episode by episode, you can see as he masters his powers, gets better at fighting, and generally becomes an honest to goodness secret scientist. Again, they never go overboard and make him unstoppable. In fact, I would say he is very stoppable. But his skills shouldn't be taken lightly, and his parents grow to recognize that. I saw what you did, Zach. You made an impossible choice in an impossible situation. And as far as I'm concerned, you made the right one. Phil Morris provides the voice of Solomon Doc Saturday, and he is one of my favorite parts. Taking his name from the old pulp hero, Doc Savage, Doc is a bona fide man of action, actively encouraging Zack to get involved with their work, though maybe more so on the science side than the actual mission side. What I love about him is that even though he's usually the most level-headed member of the team, the methods of his family can lead to him losing his cool. And it's funny every time. Huh? Why would you throw a TV? He can also be really stubborn and really petty, often holding grudges until Drew calms him down. But what comes through most of all in Morris's portrayal is just how much he loves his family, often pushing his body to the breaking point to protect them. And I would not want to get on his bad side. He might be a scientist, but that does not mean he skips gym day. But as I mentioned before, he is strictly a scientist. So whenever ideas of magic comes up, he is quick to dismiss them, much to the annoyance of Drew Saturday. So photosynthesis is now caused by wizards and pixies? Yes, and leprechauns make the stars twinkle at night. It was a figure of speech, science cop. 
outdrew his voice by the prolific Nicole Sullivan, whose job description might as well just say voice of cartoon waifus. And Drew is no exception. All of the risk-taking daredevil attitude that Zack has, he gets from Drew, and she is amazing to see in action. She's quick to pick a fight, especially when her family is in danger, and I think the reason that she's so quick to pick a fight is because 9 times out of 10, she's gonna be the one coming out as the winner. Raised by Tibetan monks after losing her family in a snowstorm, Drew grew up surrounded by magic, and although she's still a scientist, she's more than willing to believe in the more supernatural explanations, which I think when you're dealing with stuff like the Jersey Devil is a fair thing to believe in. While her and Doc butt heads a lot when it comes to magic versus science, and with how much to involve Zack in missions, the chemistry they share is some of the best I've seen in a cartoon. They are so cute, dude. Mwah. When have I ever done anything rash or irresponsible? I keep a list. It's alphabetized. And the level of sass that Sullivan gives her is just the best. Top tier waifu right here, inside and out. Their cryptid family, while present most of the time, don't really add as much, but I'm still glad they're around to add some comic relief. Komodo was consistently funny, just doing whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted. And having Zahn stay with the family while still being fairly wild was a nice touch. Viscretin does do a little bit more though, being Zack's constant companion and partner in crime. He's funny enough voiced by Diedrich Bader, who has played some pretty big characters like Hostel Gado and Billy and Mandy, as well as Bat Batman in Brave and the Bold, who is my favorite Batman after Kevin Conroy. You wouldn't get a lady, would you? The hammer of justice is unisex. Fisk is goofy, and a lot of the time he sucks up to the parents, often getting on Zack's nerves. But they always have each other's back, and Fisk can be dangerous in a fight, often fighting with every limb like a monkey. There are a few more side characters that get some screen time as well. You often see the Saturdays working with other secret scientists, which is cool because although the show focuses mostly on cryptids, it's not the only kind of pseudoscience being shown, and the other scientists give an opportunity to show everything from advanced robotics to air Aliens. My favorite of them being Dr. Beeman, voiced by Jeff Bennett, who does a great job portraying the dry-witted, snarky scientist. You lack discipline. I can smell it on your spiky haircut. There's also Olrog, king of the Kumari, an underwater race of fish people, and Zack's best friend. They share a friendly rivalry which sometimes gets them into trouble, but most of the time actually helps push them to be better. There's also Wadi, a reformed thief that becomes Zack's love interest, usually getting the better of him and stealing his belt. But the biggest side character that comes into play is the apprentice of Van Rook a mercenary cryptozoologist who actually used to date Drew. The apprentice starts off as a threat, but over time, Zack starts to admire him after he saves his life, eventually leading to the reveal that he's actually Doyle, Drew's long-lost brother. Another new apprentice, Van Rook. Didn't you warn him what I did to the last one? <laughs> he did. I'm better. Doyle is one of the best characters in the show, hands down. Always with the clever one-liners, devil may care attitude, great in a fight. I'm trying to think of a word that describes him and dreamy comes to mind? I'll unpack that later, but anyway he's great. He's voiced by Will Friedle, which means that this character is for all intents and purposes, just Terry McGinnis from Batman Beyond. It's also really cool that he voiced Ron Stoppable, and Nicole Sullivan voiced Shigo, so it's almost like a little Union. While Doyle starts off on the wrong foot with the family, especially with Doc, who he develops a rivalry with, Zack is immediately in awe of him. And Doyle seems to have a fondness for Zack as well. It's so nice seeing them bond with him taking on a kind of big brother role. I had the same kind of relationship with my uncle, so seeing them together really got to me and always left me with a smile on my face. While there were some ups and downs with Doyle having to unlearn a lot of his past criminal lifestyle, eventually he learns that the people he cares about come first, and everyone accepts him as part of the family, even Doc, who wants him to teach Zack the things he can't. And Zack's gonna need all the training he can get if he wants to get the better of Argos, who gets closer and closer to the secret of Kerr. But we'll talk about that right after this break. Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> Greetings and bienvenue. I, the incomparable VV Argos, welcome you to my humble mansion of the macabre. Alright, now it's time to get into my favorite character in the whole show. VV Argos is the host of Weird World, a TV show that shows off the mysteries of the world. But this is just a cover up, as what Argos really wants is to find Kerr and take over the world with a cryptid army. That doesn't mean he's not good at the whole TV thing though, because it is one of the highest rated in the world, and to be honest, I can see why. Corey Burton doesn't just chew the scenery when voicing Argos, he unhinges his jaws and swallows it whole. I cannot do justice to the pure pageantry he gives Argos. Conspiring with the enemy, betrayal, chicanery, heavens the drama. The dude is just hamming his little heart out. I don't think people appreciate him enough because he is just the best. He even pulls double duty as Van Rook, giving him that signature stank as well. He's such an iconic looking character too. That cloak, the hunch posture, that mask. You watch this show long enough and it is impossible to not do the voice yourself. The way he fights is really cool too, often making use of different cryptid bugs as attacks. It's really fun to watch him in battle because he doesn't really look like the type who would get into a scrape. And yeah, most of the time he leaves the fighting to his half spider manservant, Munya. But when it's time to throw some hands, Argos is no slouch. He's also a skilled manipulator, using bugs to control people's minds or sometimes just his words. This is how you make a villain, people. Someone you love to hate, full of charisma, and just so in love with being evil. It has been years since I've seen a villain in cartoons like this, and Argos made me realize how much I missed him. He's silly, sure, but there is never a time when he doesn't feel like a threat. And that is super evident as the first season draws to a close. As we follow the Saturdays throughout the show, we watch Zack grow stronger and stronger, but we also see Argos grow closer to finding Kerr, and at one point, even capturing Fisk, who Argos believes to be Kerr. To save him, the team decides to storm Weird World, the home of Argos, and also an insane death trap that has claimed the lives of many secret scientists before them. Joined by Ronnie Nagi, portrayed by the ever-talented Suzanne Blakesley, her and Argos use an item that detects Kerr on Fisk, only to reveal that while he isn't Kerr, he is a Lemurian, a Kerr Guardian. The team eventually rescue and defeat Argos, but they only narrowly escape. Now knowing that Fisk has a way to lead them to Kerr, the hunt only intensifies before ending up in Antarctica, fighting a cryptid they believe to be Kerr. Zack goes inside the monster alone to fight off Argos, and he even ends up winning, but after exiting the beast, the artifact that they thought was reacting to it stops glowing. However, when it's pointed at Zack, Yep, it turns out that Zack is the reincarnation of Kerr. When Doc and Drew were doing research on Kerr, they found an artifact called the Kerr Stone, and after unearthing it, the essence and power of Kerr transferred over to Zack while Drew was still pregnant with him. That's where Zack gets his powers from. This leads Zack into thinking that he might become evil one day, and he's not the only one, as the secret scientists that they once called their allies begin to hunt down Zack, wanting to freeze him until they can find a way to keep his power under check. It's such a crazy reveal that changes so much in the show. Zack starts to doubt himself, losing some of the hard-won control he had finally gained over his power. Hours, the Saturdays are constantly on the run, and now Argos is using this opportunity to try and influence Zack, leading him to lie and keep secrets from his parents. It just becomes really engaging and you really feel for Zack, who already had so much pressure on him when he thought that he was the only one that could defeat Kerr. But now he is Kerr, now he's gotta fight himself? Did you do this, you son of a bitch? But luckily, throughout the whole thing, his family has got his back, just like always. And that helps to focus Zack, getting him ready for the final fight against Argos, 
You see, even though Zack is Kerr, Argos has a backup plan. One of the bad guys that the Saturdays go up against are the Mondays, an evil version of themselves. Cause I guess Mondays are like an evil version of Saturday. Garfield approves. Though Drew Monday does come with some bonus features. But this means that there is another person with Kerr powers, Zack Monday, and Argos sucks them out of him, killing him in the process. And I know that he's just an evil clone, but that is still a kid corpse on TV. No idea how they got away with that. But dead kids aside, now it's Kerr against Kerr, with Zack and Argos both leading armies of cryptids against each other. It's actually pretty exciting with Van Rook even taking a hit for Drew, dying in the process. It's also revealed that Argos himself is a cryptid, but not just any cryptid. He's the yeti responsible for attacking Drew and Doyle all those years ago. It wasn't a snowstorm like they thought, just Argos being the cruel monster he's always been. The fight heats up with Zack, seemingly losing the upper hand as Argos sucks up his Kerr powers as well. But that was Zack's plan all along, as both his powers and Argos cancel each other out, destroying Argos, and seemingly getting rid of him forever. Zack barely survives, but the battle is won, and after a quick stop at Van Rook's grave, it's all over. Well, almost. Ben Tennyson, it's an honor. I'm Zack Saturday. No, you ain't! You see, a few years later in a special episode of Ben 10 Omniverse, my favorite Ben 10, the Saturdays would make one more appearance. In the episode TGIS, or Thank God It's Saturday, the whole team shows up to help Ben 10, sporting all new designs and all new voice actors, for better or for worse. And it's fine? Like, I'm excited that Secret Saturdays and Ben 10 takes place in the same universe. That part is really cool. But the whole episode itself is just kind of underwhelming. There was no hype to build it up, Doc and Drew barely say anything, and while I'm generally a big fan of Derek J. Wyatt's art style, rest in peace, some of the designs in Omniverse could feel a little cluttered. And sadly, while I don't hate them, I can't say I'm a fan of the Saturday's redesign. I mean, look at Drew, she's only like kind of hot now. It does however explain how Zack survived his powers being ripped out of him, and in this episode, it showed that he still has them, though to a lesser extent. I guess a little spark remained. While the concept is cool and all, I wish this had gotten the full fanfare that the Ben 10 and Jerry Rex crossover got, instead of just kinda happening. Maybe if it had been like an hour long to like fully highlight all different characters. Still, it was cool to see them again, even though the original voices were sorely missed. No shade to the new ones though. I will say that teaming up Argos with Dr. Animal was brilliant though. No complaints there. So what happened to the Secret Saturdays? Honestly, I'm not sure. The network obviously had faith in it. Besides the crazy way they marketed it, there were plenty of toys made for it, there was a video game, replica weapons, DVDs. This show felt like it was meant to be bigger, but the way the network handled it turned out to be its death. Cartoon Network was constantly moving it around in the schedule, and after a drop in ratings from kids not knowing when to watch the darn show, they were forced to wrap up the show in 10 short episodes, instead of the movie that was originally planned. In fact, the show didn't have any specials. That's just nuts to me. Besides Symbionic Titan, this has got to be the worst Cartoon Network has ever treated an action show. And it's a real shame because I think they made something special. The Secret Saturdays was a show that was firing on all cylinders, dude. The characters, the art, the music, the animation. But it came out during a time where Cartoon Network wasn't in the best shape. At first, they weren't making any new cartoons, and then they were making too many new cartoons, and Secret Saturdays just kinda got lost in the shuffle. And it's a real shame, because I think it could've been way bigger if they had handled it right. I would've loved an Alien Force style show, maybe showing Zack growing up into a fully fledged secret scientist, or maybe even a three-way crossover with Ben 10 and Generator Rex. It would've been the tits! But at least what we got was great, and Jay and his team put their all into making a show that stands among the best of Cartoon Network, even doing some things better than Ben 10 in my opinion. So yeah, The Secret Saturdays is insanely underrated, but that doesn't mean it's lacking in quality, because if there's one thing that shouldn't be a secret, it's the fact that this show rules.